Today is a, it's a good day. It's a good day, it's an exciting day, uh, it's a day full of, uh, of expectation and hope, and for us, as a church, it's a day of great pride, and uh, one in which we, uh, are, we look forward to every single year when uh, our seniors come, and their families, and their parents, and grandparents, and siblings, and aunts, and uncles, and everybody else comes, we come around you to join our voices uh, with the, the chorus of people in the community who are uh, so just incredibly excited and happy for you guys. Uh, at the end of high school, this is a very decorated group of individuals. Some of you, uh, if you look through the list, you'll see folks that uh, uh, we, we have a valedictorian in this group. We have Hall of Famers in this group. We have an uh, incredible group of, of young people, and we're incredibly proud of you. As everybody else does in the community, we want to give you a gift as well. The gift that we always want to give, though, is the gift of Scripture, a word from God. And so I went looking for a word from God, and I ended up in 1 Peter 4, which is where we are in the series, and the word was very strange. It was very odd. Uh, Bo read it. It was a word about great ordeals and suffering. Not exactly what I would have chosen if I was going to be choosing uh, a word for today, frankly. Um, you know, this is a day where we talk about dreams and hopes and ambitions and, and expectations for you, um, but, uh, but it's a different kind of word today. Uh, in, in thinking about uh, First Peter and thinking about this passage, I do think that, that Winnie helps us out today. Winnie, the baby that was, was born uh, recently and that comes forward today uh, to be baptized. Um, you may have missed it, but something incredibly significant just happened. The gift that we gave to Winnie is the one that I want to uh, call us back to today. Uh, baptism uh, for, uh, for us as a church is the moment in time where we are initiated into Christ's holy church we are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation. We are given an identity that we talk about a lot around here. We are, uh, we are claimed by God's grace. Uh, but we also receive a story. We receive, receive a purpose. And more than anything, the gift that we receive at baptism is the gift that I think that you guys will need more than any other gift that you're receiving. I'm sure some people are giving you gift cards. Other people are giving you uh, hopefully cars and laptops and all the rest. The thing that when I was in your position that I wanted more than anything else was just straight cash. That's what I wanted, right? So if anybody has not given the gifts to the, the graduate, you can just cash would be perfect for them. But I don't think that's what you need more than, more than anything else. What you need is something that Winnie just received that you may have forgotten. An identity, story, purpose, and something that you may not even realize that you need yet. This, this book that we've been looking at in, uh, in the New Testament, 1 Peter, is very strange. It's a book that's written in light of Easter. We've been talking about uh, since Easter, uh, you know, on Easter we celebrated, we talked about the, the light of Christ that rises from the darkness of sin and death. We talked about a love that is a power that is great to redeem. We talked about uh, the fact that God has power to give life to those in death and those uh, it calls into existence things that don't exist. But this particular book that we've been looking at is about how do you live in light of Easter? How do you live in light of the resurrection in the nitty-gritty realities of everyday life? This was written initially to a group of people who felt like they were in exile, people who felt like they were strangers and foreigners in their own home. When I was in high school, I felt like at times I was a stranger and a foreigner even in my hometown. And I was looking forward to the moment when I could leave Tupelo, Mississippi, when I could leave Mississippi and never come back, when I could get some freedom and so that I could establish myself in the world and let everybody else know who I was because the community it was coming around and telling me who I was. I didn't like that. I wanted to get out from under all of that. I felt a little bit like an exile, a stranger in a strange 
at home, but not at home, if you know what I mean. That's kind of the way this community felt in, uh, in Asia Minor. Several different churches, we're not sure what they were experiencing, but, but Peter calls them, uh, is writing to them, and he describes them as exiles, as people who were undergoing various trials and suffering and great ordeals. It's a strange book in that regard, and he's, there are a lot of affirmations and exhortations. When you're experiencing trials and ordeals and suffering, don't do evil to those who are doing evil to you. Don't revile those who are reviling you. Rather, on the contrary, bless. And then in this passage in chapter 4 we hear, don't be surprised if you experience a fiery ordeal. It's just like, that's not the word I want to hear about my future, that I may have a fiery ordeal to anticipate, to look forward to. Now, some of you uh, have experienced high school as an ordeal. And some of you who've been to college know that college can be a great ordeal, that freshman year can be a great ordeal. And the question really for the book, the question for Peter is how do you live in the midst of ordeals and suffering and trial? What is it that can help you get through those moments when you don't think you can get through on your own? He writes, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's taking place among you to test you as if that was something strange happening to you. Instead, rejoice as though you're, suff- you're sharing in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you're reviled in the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory, that is the spirit of God, rests upon you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or a criminal or a mischief maker. There's a lot of suffering by mischief makers in the days ahead. But suffer in a different way. Suffer as a Christian. Don't uh, consider it a disgrace, but glorify God because you bear this name. What do you do in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trials and ordeals? Verse 19 really gets to the thick of it. Therefore... Let those suffering in accordance with God's will commit themselves to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. I think that gives us something to do. When things are not going well, when you are experiencing ordeals, when your first year in college doesn't turn out exactly as you had hoped, when you get to a moment and your high school boyfriend or girlfriend dumps you, When you get to a moment when the major that you had set for yourself and you've been telling everybody you were going to major in this thing and this is going to be who you were going to be, when all that falls apart for you and it feels like you have no idea what to do with your life, and those moments in college when everybody else gets invited but you don't get invited or you don't get an invitation to the group that you want to be a part of, when everything begins to break down and there's loneliness and a crisis of meaning happening, what are you going to do? That's the question that 1 Peter is wrestling with. What are you supposed to do then? Commit yourself, the writer says, to a faithful creator and continue doing good. That's something that we can do. Commit yourselves to a faithful creator and continue doing good. If you... uh, the rest of you in the congregation, if, if, if you who've come visiting today are experiencing ordeals or trials or suffering or pain or grief, and you don't know what to do in that moment, First Peter gives you something to do. Commit yourself to a faithful creator and continue doing good. Committing yourself to a faithful creator. This is the only time in the New Testament that God is referred to as a faithful creator. It's kind of an Old Testament way of talking. And it's referred to here, the creative activity and the steadfastness of God is referred to here. And it it reminded me of something that Rowan Williams, who's former Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote in a little book called Tokens of Trust. He wrote this, At the heart of the desperate suffering there is in the world, suffering that we can do nothing to resolve or remove for good, there is an indestructible energy making for love. And if we've grasped what Jesus is about, then we can trust that this is what lies at the foundation 
of everything, an indestructible energy making for love. So when you commit yourself to a faithful creator, what you're committing yourself to is an indestructible energy that is making for love, that is before the experience of pain or ordeal or trial or suffering that will be there after you finish and go through that trial or ordeal or suffering that is at work in the middle of what you think is a situation that is going to break you down. There is this indestructible energy that emanates from the faithfulness of God as creator that is available to you making something new, making for love. I recently read about this guy who bought a house. And out in the front yard, when he was looking for the house, uh, he, there, was, there was one thing he didn't like about it. He liked everything about the yard except for the bamboo shoots growing in the front yard. He hated those. He hated them even more after he bought the house. And so as soon as he bought the house and had time to start working on the yard, he took his ax and just, just chopped at the roots of the bamboo shoots After he finished chopping the roots and smashing them into little pieces, then he dug down as far as he could to try to remove the root structure of the bamboo. After that, he poured plant poison on top of it. And after that, he filled the hole with several feet of gravel. And after that, he poured cement on top of uh, the, the spot. He hated bamboo, this guy. Two years later, though, he noticed something beginning to happen. A little green bamboo shoot coming up through the concrete, pushing up through the cement. That bamboo was unquenchable. It it, it felt as if it were indestructible. It was always going to come up and push through the concrete that was put on top of it. And I think that is right. That, That there is coming from God and even somehow within you, some, some thing deep within you that will arise like a tender green bamboo shoot that will push forth through any circumstance, ordeal, suffering, or pain. It's available to you in the experience itself, and you can commit yourself to it. But that's not all you have to do. There's something else. Commit yourself to a faithful creator and continue doing good. Throughout the letter of 1 Peter, there are all kinds of things that the writer gives his readers to do in the midst of the experience. Be serious and disciplined. Maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another, for whatever gift Each of you has received, you give it away like good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, when you speak, anybody who talks, speak to other people as if you're speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength of that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power forever. In the midst of the experience, when you don't know what to do, when it feels like you're in a great ordeal, just continue doing good. I, I see people doing this all the time. I see, uh, I see youth and college students do this. I see members of our congregation. I see members of our community doing this all the time, committing themselves in an age where everyone is doing their own thing, when everybody wants to be free to be themselves, to live an Instagram life, to achieve and overachieve so that everybody can see their success, what's interesting to me is the people that do something different, that commit themselves to the common good, that commit themselves to a purpose or to a place or to another person or to a community in an interesting and perhaps surprising way. I came across one of those people this week. I met this woman. Some of y'all know her. Her name is Betsy Chapman. I'm so excited to introduce her to you in a couple weeks. She's going to be part of our summer series. Um, She runs the Oxford Community Market here in town. She's a very interesting person. She, She wants to make sure that in Oxford we have good local sustainable agriculture to eat. She's interested in making everybody healthy. 
Uh, but she's interested in something more than that. She wants to make good, healthy produce available to every person in town, regardless of their socioeconomic uh, position, regardless of who they are or where they are. She's trying to create a new community here in Oxford, and it's really interesting. And when she talks about it, she's passionate. When she talks about what Oxford is and what it can become, she's completely engaged. And where she's going, I want to go. And every once in a while, you come across those kinds of people. You come across college students like that, adults like that, that have that spark of joy that comes not from decommitment and doing my own thing, but committing deeply, not only to God, but committing deeply to your community, to some other person, to some cause, to some vocation that draws them out of themselves. That kind of joy, I think, is at the heart of what First Peter is talking about when he says that in the midst of suffering, you can experience joy and rejoicing. But here's the thing, you can't forget that deep gift that we gave Winnie that I, I'm telling you, you're going to need moving forward. Some of you uh, have heard me tell the story of uh, uh, my preaching professor, Tom Long. He was at Princeton University. He was on the, this was years ago, he was on the Princeton Chaplain's Advisory Council. It met once a year, usually about this time at the end of the semester. At the end of the semester, all the chaplains would gather in. There was this advisory council, and they'd ask questions about how the, what the religious life was, was like at, at, at Princeton that particular year. And uh, one of the older members of the council asked the question of the chaplains, what are the students like morally these days? All the chaplains kind of looked around at one another morally. What is this guy getting at here? Uh, nobody wanted to answer the question. Finally, the Methodist chaplain piped up. She said, well, I think you would be pleased. Students are uh, very ambitious in terms of their careers, but that's not all they are. They tutor kids after school. They, uh, they work at the food pantry for the homeless. Last week, they protested the apartheid. Kind of dates the story a little bit. But as she was talking, the Jewish chaplain piped up. His name is Eddie Feld. And, and, and he, he kind of grinned, and, and the Methodist chaplain got a little bit uh, frustrated. What are, you, what are you grinning about? What are you laughing about? What if, what if what I'm saying is so funny to you? He said, no, I didn't mean to, to rock the boat here. I'm just thinking that one of the things that's interesting about what you're saying is that you're saying that students are good people, and they are. You're saying that they're involved in good causes, and they are. But one thing that they lack is a vision of salvation. Everybody looked at the Jewish chaplain. Seriously? All the rest were Christian. He said, no, it's true. If you don't have a vision of what God is doing to repair the whole of creation, you can't get up out of bed in the morning and go to work. It's finally going to beat you down. If you don't have some vision of what God is doing to repair all of creation, it's hard to get out of bed and face the day because it's finally going to beat you down. I think ultimately, the, the gift of baptism it's not just an identity. It doesn't just tell you who you are. Child of God claimed by grace. It doesn't just give you a story of, of how God uh, created the world, but also this vision of what God is doing to repair all of creation and that you have a role within that. Winnie has a place within that. Y'all have a place within that. And you guys have a place within that story. It can give you purpose. It can give you meaning. But more than anything else, and this is the gift, it can give you hope. And you can't live without hope. I was fascinated and moved to hear about the obituary of Rabbi Hugo Grin several years ago, one of Great Britain's most decorated and respected rabbis. When he was a boy, he and his family were in Auschwitz. And in the midst of Auschwitz, his father insisted that they continued keeping Sabbath and honoring the festivals of their religion. Even on a day, um, Hugo remembered until the day that he died, um, he remembered this day when to observe the Sabbath, his father took a piece of string, dipped it in some butter, and lit it for a Shabbat candle. His, Hugo, who was just a little boy at the time, protested, No, Father, this is all the butter that we have. And his father said something that he would never forget. You can live for weeks, son, without food. 
but you can't live for a minute without hope. And that's the gift that the church offers to you as you embark on the next transition that you'll go into. We have so much hope for you. You're going to do incredible things with your life. We know it. And we're going to be here for the journey. We're going to be supporting you when you fall and cheering you on as you succeed. But in the midst of the great ordeals that you will experience, in the midst of suffering and trial and pain, never forget that at this font, we gave you the gift of hope, of a God who is committed to your cause, a God who is committed to your cause, a God who is at work in the midst of every ordeal to bring you through, that is an indestructible energy making for love, and that is repairing the universe. Day by day, healing by healing, reconciliation by reconciliation, wholeness for wholeness. Thanks be to God. Amen. It seemed appropriate as a response to God's word today for all of us, not just the graduates, but for us as a congregation to remember our baptism, uh, to affirm our faith together, to give our graduates an opportunity to, to touch the water, to remember their baptism and be thankful. We're going to pray a, a prayer as a congregation, family and friends as, and congregation. We're going to bring the graduates forward to kneel and pray over them. And then we're going to give you guys an opportunity to pray a prayer of self-dedication. So don't forget your bulletin when you come forward. All right, let's uh, enter into this response to God's word together with the renunciation of sin and profession of faith. I invite all of you to stand.